You can see the chat on the right side or below you, okay? So just put where you are, give us some comments and likes because that actually helps the video to be shown on other people's feed. And if you have a second, share that. The whole podcast is just content, so it's so safe for you to share on groups. There's nothing going to be sold here. So content only that will help other artists, okay? Just a few things that you can do. And while you're whatever on Instagram or, or Facebook or YouTube, don't forget to either like or subscribe so you can get notifications later about our podcast. Every week we bring a new artist to talk to us. Today, we are going to talk about marketing, okay, in art. And I brought my best friend, my bestie, Robert Imbriali. Welcome, Robert. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, Shahar. Happy to be here. We're, yeah, you mentioned we're going to have an artist, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm not really an <laughs> yeah, artist. No, no, no. <laughs> But you have a lot of experience working with artists, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Lots of experience working with artists. You know, you were here on an episode, I think, in December, that we talked a little bit about the mindset for artists, right? But before we dive deep into talking about marketing, let us know a little bit about you. I have been in the uh, creative world my entire life. Uh, started, I know it's funny, I'm going to show you something, you're going to laugh but I have to show it to you anyway, okay? Okay. <clears throat> the other day I found the very first camera I ever had. Are you kidding? <laughs> this is the very first, I had this when I was 12 years old. <laughs> oh so I started very early with um, photography and uh, you know, that is an art form. Obviously painting yeah. with light is what photography is. And went through college, became a commercial photographer, loved that, worked in the largest photo studio in Manhattan, and then realized there was something more. So I got into advertising for a little bit and finally found uh, marketing. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing marketing ever since for all kinds of businesses, large and small, and uh, everything from copywriting to ads and Facebook and social media and direct mail and all of it. I've been doing it all over the years, and I've been working with Wellburn Gordon Farm for... Oh, it's been now since September of 2000, I started with them. Wow. So it's been quite a while. Yeah, 17 yeah. years. Wow, that's a long well, time. Hey, <laughs> hey, we're not supposed to count. <laughs> Didn't I tell you that? <laughs> yeah, right. It's dangerous right, counting. It's dangerous. Right? Yeah, it is dangerous. <clears throat> Robert, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this is an interactive podcast. That's the reason we go live. So anybody can ask a question anytime they want about marketing, right? And right. how to improve your marketing skills as an artist. And we already have a question, so are you ready for it? Of course. Okay, so Melissa Tarek is asking, my difficulty is being seen as an artist because I work in papier-mâché and I'm lumped into as a crafter and not an artist, which means I end up doing mostly craft shows, which, which is fine and I respect other words work, but not being considered a real artist gets old fast. What should I do? What difference does it make? <laughs> That's the real question, right? Because the, uh, the identity is the identity people are placing on you isn't your identity. I had this crisis early on in my career too. And people were thinking of me in a certain way and I wasn't that. And at some point I just realized it doesn't really matter what they think. It's what I think. And it's how the work that I put out. So, um, you know, guilt by association, if you're attending crafting fairs, then people are going to see you as a crafter. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's, you know, it's like, that's where you show up. That's where you are. People don't know any different. So they look at you and say, that's what you are. If you want to be seen as something else, you've got to show up in, in different places. Uh, maybe the more of the fine art shows and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an interesting um, conundrum for a lot of people because they're, they're so afraid of what other people are going to think. But I think the truth is, is it's more important what you think and how you show up and how you see yourself mm -hmm. than it is what other people think. And then by extension, what are you going to do? Uh, where are you going to show up? Where are you going to put your art? Where Where is it going to be alongside? In other words, you're putting your art uh, next to a bunch of crafters. Of course, you're going to get lumped in uh, with the crafters. If you're putting it next to fine artists, well, you'll get lumped in there too, and they'll see you more as a fine artist. So mm -hmm. uh, those choices, uh, you know, you need to make on a daily basis, I would say. It's a, it's not something that's an overarching one thing, one time uh, decision. It's really the small decisions you make along the way, and that yeah. makes the difference. Yeah. And I would suggest maybe looking into your town for exhibitions that you can start participating or groups that are more involved in, 
in art events. For example, here in town, Robert, we have the Utah Surface Designers, and the Surface, de surface Designers, they are in every town. And they focus a lot into looking for exhibition and galleries and things like that. So if you can get together with a group like that, maybe that would make that divide that you're looking for. Robert, Absolutely. is marketing easy? Is marketing easy for me? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I got in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to say it here. Marketing is common sense. And what happens is people get upset because they're like, well, you know, people have an entire career on marketing. How can you just say it's common sense? That means anybody can do it, right? Um, but the truth is we're marketed to all day long, so it's not a mystery. Mm -hmm. We know what works. <clears throat> you know, pick up a magazine, uh, scroll through your, your Facebook feed, your email, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're seeing marketing all day long. So it's not like it's a foreign concept to us. It's when we start to think of it as something complex is where we go wrong. The truth is, you just look at it and say, what causes people to buy? What is it? That, what is it going to? You know, what do you need to say? What do you need to show? What do you need to do in order to entice somebody to buy from you? And for me, it's common sense. It because it, you know we we are consumers, all of us. We all love to buy, and we all hate to to be sold to. Mm -hmm. So you look at it from that perspective. Okay, when I'm when I'm in that space where I really love to buy, what am I feeling? What's the environment? What 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 is the what are the emotions that are coming up? And you can start asking those questions. You can get a really good feel for marketing. And you know, too, when you walk in somewhere and you go, wow, these guys really have their marketing down. You walk into a restaurant. We do this all the time. Walk into a restaurant, look at the menu and go, oh, you know, they didn't do this right. They didn't do that right. Or you walk into a restaurant, guy, these guys have their marketing down. Look at the way they, they describe each one of these plates that they're offering, right? It makes, you, it makes your mouth water. You want it so much. And when you look at it that way and you say, wow, that really makes a lot of sense. This is really smart. Um, again, I say you can see the marketing all around, I, and I'm saying this from the perspective of somebody who learned a lot of my marketing early on by looking at other marketing. I used to go uh, and get my mail at the uh, post office every day, and it wasn't just a handful of mail like a lot of people get. They handed me a bin. You know those giant bins you get at the post office? I used mm -hmm. to get one of those every single day. Wow. Uh -huh. And my evening fun used to be opening up all the sales letters and reading them. Right. Because mm -hmm. I learned so much by not by reading a book about it, but by actually reading the materials that were coming out. And I learned so much about marketing back then. And then later when I got a little bit more formalized education, going to seminars and learning from some of the, the smartest marketers out there, it was all of it made sense because it wasn't a mystery to me anymore. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is if you can is look at some of those people in your industry, whatever industry you're in, who are doing very well and then model them. I didn't say copy. I said model them. Mm -hmm. Look at what they're doing and say, what parts of what they're doing can I integrate into my own marketing? And you're going to find that that's sort of the shortcut, if you will, to getting your, your marketing down. And people say it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. But really, when you start to dissect it, it's really not as hard as it seems. Mm -hmm. I agree. I like to, to also look at all industries because you never know where a good idea is going to come from. Right, right? exactly. Yep. Uh, Guest 310 is asking... Or where do you think the next big platform for marketing will be? And I, I think it's because we hear a lot today about Facebook and what's happening. What's your take on that? Facebook is uh, in the process of dying. It's sad to say, but it is in the process of dying. Everything you know has its lifespan. Uh, tell you the truth, Facebook is now, what, 11 years old? That's a very long lifespan in the social media world. They don't last that long, uh, these networks. And you saw MySpace, which was the end-all, be-all of everything. It's gone. You saw Friendster. You saw you know, so many networks that have come and gone. And Facebook just is the one that grew the biggest and, and probably the fastest of all of them. But they've made some changes to their algorithms. They've made some changes to the way they do things that uh, is really pushing people off of it. And the common response I hear from people these days, and I always ask, I was at a seminar last week, and I asked everyone, I said, do you use Facebook more now or less than you have in the past? And everyone thinks about it for a moment, and they go, you know what, I'm using it a lot less. Why? Because we've taken so much of the content off of it. We've got rid of all the publishing, the publishing industry. We got rid of the magazines. We got rid of the newspapers. Got rid of all that. Killed a lot of the advertising. Uh, didn't allow businesses to promote themselves. And you look and you say, really, what they want is friends and family. But the problem with it is my friends and family don't post a whole lot. So I can go on Facebook once a week and never miss anything. You know what yeah. I mean? Where in the past you couldn't because there was so much coming and it was always interesting and always something new to look at. Um, so they kind of made a mistake there, I think, and, and they will probably correct it along the line somewhere, uh, hopefully before it's too late. 
So the question everyone's asking, what's the next big platform right now, today, if you're going to ask that question, Instagram. Now, interestingly, Instagram is also owned by Facebook, mm -hmm. right? But it's a different kind of social network. There's less interaction in, in a lot of ways. And it is certainly a visual medium where Facebook, you could post a, just a text post on Instagram. It's got to be an image. And now they just opened up IGTV, which allows you to do live streaming video. Uh, from your phone, which is really an inter interesting thing as well. So you say you're an artist and you say you want to get more exposure. Um, look to Instagram because Instagram, it's really, really a nice platform, very easy to use, probably a lot easier in, in many ways than Facebook. Mm -hmm. And right now there's more energy there. I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. I, I post stuff both on Facebook and on Instagram. On Facebook, I get made 200 likes. And on Instagram, I'll be over 500 likes in, in the same amount of time. And I have fewer followers on Instagram than I do on Facebook. Than you do. Now, so. what you just said is kind of scary, right? <laughs> because as an artist, I know many of us are on Facebook. So I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Let's suppose I have a page for my art on Facebook. And I have thousands of followers, two, three thousand. Are you saying that's not enough for me right now? If you're calling them followers, you're using the wrong terminology. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's a business page or a fan page and somebody has clicked the like button, mm. they're not a follower. Facebook has changed what it, it considers a follower. So if I go to your page, Shahar, and I say, oh, creativity and focus, I'm going to click the like button. Now, I have sent a signal to Facebook that I like your page. So in theory, that would mean that I would see everything that you post on this page. That is not what's happening anymore. So Facebook has determined that somebody clicking the like button is not enough of a signal mm. for you to be able to see that content. So now it's throttled that content back. So anybody clicking like on your page is no longer seeing your content. They might see it occasionally. They might see one every six months. They might show it to 100 people. But you're not going to see it on a regular basis anymore like you used to. So what is considered engagement from Facebook? Well, if somebody joins a group... Now they consider that engagement. So if you're part of a group, so instead of a page, you go over and you say, I'm going to create creativity and focus the group, right? And you go create this group. What ends up happening is Facebook sees that as, well, if somebody took the time to say, I want to join the group, maybe the group has questions that they ask before the person joins. You know, that's a, that's a bigger signal to them that you really want to engage with this content. So if you post something in a group, now those people who are group members are more likely to see it. It will get distributed. Yeah. And they also so get the, the notifications from the right, group. right. Yeah, but not everybody can create a group for their art because it wouldn't make sense, right? The the thing with the group is we have a common passion. So let's say I don't know watercolor uh, painting, for example, and then we go around that. But the groups do, they don't allow you to sell at all. So how do I promote myself as an artist then? One of the neat things about groups is, uh, first of all, join them. <laughs> you know, get a, get involved in as many groups as you can. And what you want to do is be responding to people's comments that are already there um, rather than posting your own content. So what happens in the group, the moderator is going to see, somebody puts a post in the group, and they're going to see that, and they're going to say thumbs up or thumbs down. They're either going to let it in or they're going to get rid of it, right? But what happens when you put the, the information on the comments, they're less likely to see it. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have more latitude there to be able to promote yourself and talk about yourself and say, you know, just uh, somebody else doing similar artwork to you say, hey, do you want to get together and, and let's share something? Follow me on Facebook or, or let's be friends on Facebook. And you can start building your audience one by one, step by step, little by little. Um, you can do that. So somebody would ask, okay, how much time should I be investing in uh, social media? Pretty much as much as you can. It is a, it is a labor-intensive game, and there's no real shortcuts. I mean, you can automate some of this stuff, but automated posts just aren't the same. They don't have the same energy as you actually being there and responding to somebody else and and you know liking their stuff and and you know making a few nice comments, a, a few little notes of appreciation. Artists love that, um, and and certainly you love it too. So why not give it so you can get it in your turn? You that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to take the time to do it. So you really have to set aside, uh, get in the habit of setting aside time every day to do this. And I know people hate to hear that, but that's the truth. If you want social media to work, you've got to work it, right? It's not just a magic bullet where you're going to put something up and you're going to have a million people are going to come. It's not going to happen that way. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen the more you post. So people talk about building an Instagram audience, right? And the number one thing they talk about is frequency of posting. 
And people are like, well, how often should I post on Instagram? I post, you know, once a month. Not going to do it, right? If you want to build a following on Instagram, get this. Three to five posts every single day. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's a, that's a, I, I hear that. I hear I hear you're already you're already tired just hearing that. I get it. <laughs> well, especially if you don't do only in one platform, that's the main the main problem, right? If you're well, trying to market in more that. than one place, three or four posts every day and yeah, different but, stuff. Exactly. But Shahar, you gotta solve that and you've got to pick a platform because you mm -hmm. cannot do it on all the platforms, right? You can't True. post four or five times on, on Instagram and then say I'm gonna do some Facebook and then I'm gonna move over to Twitter and then I'm gonna go, you know, it's like you mm -hmm. can't do that. But you you have a life. You can't you can't be posting all day. I so you kinda to gotta a pick life. the platform. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pick the platform that works best for you mm -hmm. and you know, stick with that one and put the energy into that. Now, let's talk a little bit about Instagram because I can see here in the comments that some people don't have accounts there or some do, but they're really not using. And we know it's based on visual on Instagram, so pictures, mm -hmm. and there's really not too much interaction between people like we have on Facebook. So how do I market on Instagram? There's more interaction on Instagram than on Facebook. How? And what you do is you make sure you put your hashtags in. Okay. So I started on Instagram. I, I had an account, then I canceled it because I wasn't using it. And then I set up a new account and I did a little experiment. I put a post up there and then I used a handful of hashtags and I had like five people following me. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I've got 20 likes, 20 little hearts, right? That came in. It's like, wait a minute, I've got more hearts on this than I did from the people following me. Obviously not just the people following you are seeing that content, right? Mm -hmm. So the hashtags become your key. They're, they're kind of like keywords, if you will. Uh, so if you're putting in your art, make sure you have, and they say five to nine hashtags are good for each one of your posts. Okay. So that'll get you beyond just the people who are following you. Because so, you're right. If you're, you just have a handful of people following you, you're, don't, you're not using Instagram, well, great. Your, your posts aren't going to go anywhere because nobody knows how to find them. So they find them by the hashtags, by the keywords that I put after whatever I write there, right? After, With the... we're actually in the text too. Uh -huh. You wanna come see my wood carving? Wood carving is a hashtag, hashtag wood carving. You know what I mean? You put it right in the, right in the copy. You can do that or you can put it after. I do both. Okay. Breach is saying, we need to have time for the art as well. Robert, <laughs> would you, can you, can you say it slower, okay? What exactly is hashtags and how do I use them? Hashtags are keywords, and hashtag used to be known as the pound sign. Uh, in in for us old timers, you know, we look or at the that. Tic -tac -toe that's the pound sign, sign right? <laughs> it's now called a hashtag. So you put the pound sign, and then you put a keyword after it. And as you start typing the keyword, Instagram's going to give you suggestions of popular hashtags, and you can use those that pop up. So if you're so would you suggest ahead. that we created like a spreadsheet with the main? Let, let's suppose I'm a sculptor with polymer clay. So I would add all the hashtags in a, in a word file or a spreadsheet and say polymer clay sculpting, polymer clay sculptor, polymer clay, things like that, correct? Artist, gourd art, uh, you know, crafter, uh, some of the more generic terms are good to add in there as well. But yes, absolutely in the right direction with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I say, don't stuff it with too many because if you put 20 in there, you know, the post is going to go nowhere. It's going to look like spam to Instagram. So five so to nine. Is five right. to nine seems to be the sweet spot that you want to do. No less than five, no more than nine. And Bree is asking, how do people see them? So you put everything in that post. So what happens? People are, are searching by keyword when they go to explore. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if I'm on Instagram and I'm kind of bored with the people I'm following and they're not posting anything new, I can put a hashtag polymer clay and um, polymer clay. Let me say that right. Yeah. And, and I will pull up all the posts that have that hashtag in it. And I get all kinds of new stuff that, that I can see and new people I can follow. And I can build my list that way. If I'm interested in that, that's the best way to build uh, Instagram into something that you actually want to spend time on, right? Because mm -hmm. you could follow just a whole bunch of random people. I was at a seminar once and somebody said, who do I follow on Instagram? And the speaker came up on stage and said, well, you know, follow JLo and follow. It's like, what? These people are not going to be people that you really want to do business with or, or people you want to interact with. Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. I said, instead, you know, search by keyword, 
follow the people that are posting those kinds of things. And, and so the, the feed that you're creating for yourself is one that, uh, you know, is interesting. It's going to attract you back and you're going to come back and, and see stuff that you really want to uh, interact with. I think one cool part about Instagram right now is that you can actually follow the hashtags. So, yes, for example, Bri, it's not different than what you do on Pinterest, right? You go right. there and you type something like pipe cleaner sculpting. I did that the other day. So on Instagram, you will pull all the people that have pictures related to that. But you can also follow that hashtag. So every time you go there it shows some of those people there. Correct, Robert? Correct, absolutely. And you brought up the other, the other great network for um, uh, you know, artists is Pinterest. Pinterest, obviously, similar to Instagram in that it's visual, right? And you can post your art up there. And if you pin from your page, from your website, or from Etsy, or from wherever your, your stuff is hosted, when they click on that, they go right back to your page. So you do generate a lot of traffic from there. And again, hashtags are important there as well. So that's a great point, Albert. Uh, Albert. <laughs> Albert. Looks like I don't know you. <laughs> and, hey, you said I was your best friend at the beginning of this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like we don't talk every day. Right? I know, right? <laughs> so I have a question about websites and how people post. But first, we have a few more questions. But if I forget, remember, remind me of that. Sandy is asking, are you giving away your rights, uh, the rights of your pictures with Instagram by posting on Instagram? Uh, no, they're not allowed to use them in advertising and stuff like that. They, they can't do that. You're not giving the rights away. You don't give. Uh, guest return. How important is it to be specific with your hashtags? For example, car versus cars. How specific should you go? Well, cars would be a terrible hashtag because you'd look, at, you'd look up the hashtag and you'd see that there are probably 50 million posts with that and no one's going to find yours, right? Mm -hmm. So more specific is better. Okay. So and clay artist is better than working with clay or, you know, clay or, you know, just something that would be more generic. The more specific it can be, the better. Yeah. The deeper you go, it would bring you, you a more qualified person. Well, yeah, you want more qualified people to look at your stuff. You don't want it kind of just all over the place or, or part of a, such a big group that nobody's ever going to find it. Yeah. True. Alison B is asking, is it better to have more followers or for you to be following more people? Well, Instagram has a dirty little secret. Okay, you can Alice. only follow 7,500 people. Hmm. And it's a hard limit. You can't go beyond that. And what normally happens is you'll follow people and they will typically follow you back on Instagram. It's different than Facebook. Um, you don't need permission. You don't have to be a friend. You know, any of that stuff. You can just follow people. But there is a hard limit of 7,500. And when you hit that limit, you're not going to be able to follow any more people. Hmm. So you have to <clears throat> really have a, I have a tool that I use. I, I should look on the phone. I think it's called Instagram Cleaner. Okay. I'll just look at it real quick here. You'll bear with me. Okay. While he does that, Instagram Cleaner is the cleaner name of the app. Cleaner for Instagram. Well, so, say it again. Cleaner for Instagram. Cleaner for Instagram is the name of and the app. And it's an app. And what you do is you go in and you, you can, it'll pull down all of your Instagram followers. And I go in and I select anybody who's not following me back, unfollow them. Mm. And it removes all those so I can follow more people and then add more people to, uh, you know, my following. So Instagram visual, Pinterest visual, what's the main difference between the two of them? Links. Okay. So if you want to drive people back to a website, Pinterest is much, much, much more effective at that because when they click on it, they go to your website. When they click on something in Instagram, they go nowhere, right? So there's no link in there. Mm -hmm. Now, the caveat or the, the exception here is that when you have 10,000 followers on Instagram, all of a sudden things change. So 10,000 followers on Instagram, now you can have this swipe up thing and people can click and actually go to uh, a link. So what they kind of do is they kind of say, well, you know, if you're a serious Instagram user, we're going to give you this additional perk. Well, there's some other things that come with hitting 10,000. Everybody out there today is looking for, how do I get to 10,000? How do I get to 10,000? How do I get to 10,000? I want to unlock all the Easter eggs, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> so they're, they're going in that direction with it. It makes sense. Yeah. But it's a lot of work to get there. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at 9,000 and change now, 9,200, I think. Getting close to the 10,000 mark when I hit that. I'll be able to tell you from experience what happens. But I'm going to tell you right now at 9,000 already, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm having companies contact me that they want to post on my feed for money. Mm -hmm. They want to pay me to post something on Instagram. So a lot of people end up creating businesses, you know, side businesses with that. And they start advertising when they have enough followers. 
That's so cool. Yeah. So without the social media, does an artist need a website or a blog? Yes. Tell me why. Yes. Um, you have to have a place that's yours. Um, as we've all experienced this year with Facebook, after we've spent money and time and energy building our fan pages, Facebook goes, yeah, we're not going to support that anymore. And scratch it all out, basically, right? Mm -hmm. There's still fan pages. You can still build them. You can still like pages. But there pretty much is no point to it because you're never going to see anything from that page unless you go specifically to that page and nobody does that. So you always want to have a place that's yours, a place you can call home, a place that you control, a place that uh, is uniquely yours. You can design it. You can say what you want. You're not, you know, not, uh, there's no rules. There's no community guidelines. There's, you do what you want to do on your own website. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to have your own website. However, how you get people to your website is you use the social media. So they kind of work hand in hand, right? So Pinterest, you'll pin up a photo of your art. You'll put your hashtags. And the link is always going to come back to what? got to come back to your website Sorry. or mm -hmm. if you're using etsy or something like that where you're actually selling your art um you want them to go there you want to mm -hmm. generate the traffic that way yeah, so true. they're hand in hand you can't you, you can't have one without the other really i've seen more and more artists that they they say oh nobody goes to websites anymore so social media is enough i also find this a huge trap because you know that the rules change constantly. I mean, we've been in, in this game for many years, right, Robert? Yeah. And you know, it, it's constantly changing. So what I tell people is, if you don't have control over your business online, you don't You're have a business online. Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, you know, when, when Facebook first came out, they created groups. It was one of the first things that they created. And I went out and I told everybody, I said, go create a group. This is the most amazing thing ever. You could email at the time everybody that was in the group. You mm -hmm. could sell inside the group. You could you could put add to cart buttons. You could have a shopping cart in there. They had so many tools. It made having a website obsolete. Mm -hmm. So I would tell people, you know, this is great. You don't even need a website. Just go on Facebook, create a group, and you can do all this stuff. And then Facebook said, yeah, we don't think so. So they stopped the ability to email all the people in the group. And then they removed the the buy now links and the and the shopping cart. And they removed this. And all the, all of a sudden they killed the groups. Mm -hmm. So the groups died. And in favor of these fan pages. So everyone went crazy and said, we're going to build fan pages. We're going to fill fan pages. And now this year, they basically killed fan pages. So now we're back to groups again. It's like we're little ants running from you know, here to there. And if you don't have your own website, this is not a way to go through life. This is and, not what you want to be doing. Yes. And not only mm. that, you're, all, you're also spending more time than you realize. And when you think about time is your most precious asset, it's actually costing you money to do all yes. this. Absolutely. And you still, if something changes, you're down in the water. There's nothing you can do. Well, you had the question earlier, and they said, when, when is there time for the art? Mm -hmm. Right? And there's that yeah, balance that, that comes up. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you got to look at it, and you got to say, okay, where, where are we going to have time for the art? It's like, that's got to be the priority. And what I suggest to a lot of artists who are uh, basically masters at what they do, if they don't enjoy the marketing, have somebody else do it. Stay focused on creating the art. Do the best job you can possibly do there. Hand it off. Have somebody else do the selling part of it. Because yeah. it really is two different skill sets, and they don't mesh very well. Right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's really on their creative side and their, their, uh, their artistic side has a very difficult time with technology because they yeah. need to be on your logical side. And it's just, it's just very different. So two types of people in the world, right? You have the people who, if I say, if you're at A and you want to get to C, an artist might say, I just jumped to C, no problem. And why mm -hmm. couldn't I just jump to Z? Yeah. Logical person will say, if I'm at A and I want to get to C, then I have to go through B. And they wouldn't even entertain any other way. So somebody learning computers, you know, they'll either be on the logical side, it'll make a lot of sense to them. If they're on the artistic side, it makes no sense whatsoever because it's not relational. Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Why is this related to this? Why can't it just be something else, right? Mm -hmm. And it's always very confusing. So if that's you, if you're the artist, get somebody else to do it. Get your grandkid, get your nephew, a niece, <laughs> you know what I mean? Somebody who loves this stuff, have them put up your Etsy website. You just give them the stuff and, and off you go. Now, I want to mention one thing here that's real important that pretty much all the artists miss. Number one thing, if you're selling art, is the photo, Right? Mm -hmm. How many times you, you know you look at a piece of art and you might look at it and say, "Wow, that looks really huge. It looks like it's you know this big, but in reality, it's this big, right? Yeah. You don't know. There's no size reference. There's no energy to it. Uh, the photo is either poorly lit or it's out of focus or it's off color or all of that stuff. Well, it doesn't sell. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm going to use Apple as an example, but they're a horrible example because they are extreme perfectionists. Right. When they put out a, a product photo, it is absolutely perfect. There is not one pixel that's wrong with it. So you want to be moving in that direction as much as you possibly can. Get the best quality photos um, that you know how to get. These little guys here are great. Um, this is the iPhone 10. And the camera in here is 12 megapixels. It's as good as the DSLRs used to be in uh, like five years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can get really good quality photos. Um, if you don't have good lighting, go outside early in the morning when it's still overcast before the sun comes out. And you can use that light um, is really smooth, very soft lighting um, to get photos of your art. And make sure your backgrounds are uncluttered, right? There's not a lot of junk distracting. You just want to have it as clear as possible. Hang up a sheet, a piece of paper, or shoot it up against the wall, you know, something that's clear um, so that people really focus on the art. And the other thing is, if you really need to show the size of it, have somebody hold it, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing better than a hand in the photograph to show the size reference because uh, that ends up being a huge problem with uh, a lot of the photographs. You never know how big something is. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from, uh, actually, we have several questions. Allison, should you sell on your website or places like uh, Etsy, Fine Art, America, et cetera? All of the above. All of the above. Right. Well, there's, there's no limit to it, right? So it's not like if you're putting it on Etsy that you can't sell it on your website too, mm -hmm. right? And you don't know where that person's coming from or where, where they're seeing it. If they're seeing it on Etsy, let them buy it there. If they're seeing it on your website, well, let them buy it there too. Don't send it back to Etsy, right? Yeah. Have them buy it off your website if you can do that. Yeah. Um, if it's too complicated, pick a, pick a platform. If it's Etsy, then everything points back to Etsy. Um, my preference is to have it all over the place, but you know, that can be a little complex to manage sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's sold on my website. I got to remember, I got to take it off Etsy too, because it'll sell again. There's only one of them. You know? Yes. There's more management there. And you yes. have to take into consideration the fees as well. Yes. In like Etsy a week ago, uh, increased 5% their, uh, the, the fee that they charge. And now they are charging that fee, combining shipping. So you're paying 5% not only on the final price point that you put, but together with shipping, which I, be, I believe is very unfair. It's terribly unfair because you're not making money on shipping. Shipping yes, you're giving to the yeah. post office or UPS. Yeah. Shipping is already a, a huge nightmare, right? Yeah, for it any is. Of it's us always a problem. Sell. Yeah, it's a problem for every business. I, I, you know, I speak with a lot of different businesses, and everyone's struggling with shipping. And uh, you know, UPS is threatening to go on strike and raise the rates again. And uh, it's like they already had an up, you know, a, a raise in January, and now they mm -hmm. want to raise them again. It's really, it's hard. It's the hardest thing in e-commerce is the shipping. Yeah. So. You have to take into consideration that when you're creating the price, because on your site, you may be just paying the fees to a processor like PayPal or something else. But when you go into a, another platform, you, nev you need to be aware. Yeah, and just be careful not to have two different prices on something, right? Yes. So it's like it's $40 here, but if you buy it on Etsy, it's 60 because yeah. of the fees. Uh, you know, people, people will spot that, and they see it, and they go, well, this person's out of integrity. Yeah, you, you need to have both on the same place. Yeah. If it's consistent. Uh, Bree is saying, wow, great information. Thank you. Robert, do you have a recommendation for a place to build a website? Yeah, the easiest place is to go to wordpress.com. I think it's $5 a month and you get a WordPress website, thousands of themes. They actually have a social network built in there so you can share WordPress sites. So if anyone asks me the easiest, quickest thing to do, you're up in five minutes and you don't have to worry about managing the back end, uh, upgrades. You have to worry. They take care of all of that stuff. And I think their their lowest plans like four ninety nine a month. It's really cheap, and it'll get you what you want. Plus, it has e commerce. Mm -hmm. Jen Zuba is asking: Is a, is a free website pretty much useless? Are you there? Ooh, I think I. Uh, Robert. Robert, can you hear me? Just a sec. Oop, session ended. What happened? What? I keep going. I keep going. So we are trying to get him back. Uh, I don't know what happened, but while we do that, let me let me see. 
I'm not going to, uh, to ask the question that I already did to him the, about Jan. So let's see, we lost him, yeah? Hey guys, we need to watch from beginning, yep. Yeah, so uh, we, we were talking about different social networks and a little bit about the website. Uh, another thing that you need to be aware when uh, you're using just social media is the fact that many times you cannot use, for example, Facebook to post your pictures on, let me send him a, a link here. Me too? So I'm talking to nobody? Okay. Okay, I'm sending to him a new link so he can uh, come back, and I'm doing the same thing here. So you, you need to understand that many of them don't communicate, so you cannot post the, the, well, you can post your pictures from Facebook to Instagram, but not to Pinterest, for example. So you need to be aware of that as well. And uh, here it says unable to connect. And that's another reason why you need to be careful to have a place where you actually can control. The main message he was giving you is this. Okay, you do have to use uh, all the, the platforms out there. You, you need to become good in one. So for example, if you resonate a lot with Facebook, you focus more on that. But you have to have in the back of the, your mind that that may uh, decrease in results over time for what is happening. Uh, for example, if we, we think about Facebook right now and what is going on, I was talking about this with Nashla this morning. Uh, you go, they show you less because they think, okay, you, you, you have to see your friends and family more than anything. Well, I actually don't see my family whatsoever on Facebook and they decide what they are showing to me, but I see the same posts over and over and over again. Every time I log in, I see the same thing. Two days later, I see the same thing. So you have to be careful uh, because this, might, this may decrease over time and you have to think, okay, where am I going to go next? So personally, what I would suggest is work on at least two platforms uh, at the same time. So should this one go, this other one will come. And uh, let me write Nashla here, just a second. So think about this, it may be Facebook and Instagram, if that's what you resonate with. I have my own doubts about Instagram. Uh, I, don't, I understand that there is a huge migration there and it's a good platform, but I don't know. I, for me, and that's personal, it lacks engagement. Uh, I cannot talk and comment to people. Here on Facebook, I'm always uh, doing that with everybody, so I hope uh, another thing shows up at some point, and we can actually migrate to that. Uh, is Robert there? Let me see now. V there is a, hey, you're there. I'm chatting with them. I was about to say there is a, a social network that only works on cell phones called, and I don't know if the right pronunciation is Vero or Vero, V-E-R-O. And it, it is meant for artists. Uh, so for me, it's not very functional because I rather work, especially when I'm talking to people from a desktop than on my phone. I, I'm not much of a phone person. So I don't know if it's going to work, but it's interesting and it is meant for artists. Have you tried that at all? A social network. It was a what? I thought it was just for payment, for sharing. Oh, no, I'm talking, no, I'm thinking, no. I'm thinking Venmo, I think is what Vimo, I'm thinking. Yeah, Venmo, yeah, yeah, yes. But this yeah. one is, is this, Vero, V-E-R-O. Well, I've got, I've got homework then. I've got something to look into. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you the link. Uh, guess 36, oh, let me see if I, okay. Guess 362. Would you recommend YouTube to promote your art? Only if you're good at making videos. Hmm. It's, it's a different kind of game, and typically um, it's not for the, like a one-off sale. It's for something uh, more like a product that you've got thousands of. It works better for that because the video has a long lifespan there. Um, you know, you want quick response if you're trying to sell something. So that's why Instagram, Pinterest. Pinterest is not really quick, though. Pinterest says they changed the half-life of a, of a post from three and a half months. Now they say a post will have a half-life of six months, which would tell me that the post will last an entire year hmm. on Pinterest. We, we see 
quite a bit of traffic coming from Pinterest, but again, it's, it's not something that if I post today, I see results tomorrow. Right. Again, takes a couple of months. We, we see, when I think about buyers though, I'm, I'm not sure that's one for us, for example. We, we use it a lot like we do with a bunch of them, but I have my doubts. Uh, I was going to ask you, oh, I have something to say about videos though for artists. Uh, if you're trying to teach your art, you have to be careful on how many tutorials you put out there, okay? We have experienced this at Curious Mondo, Robert. Some uh, people have a lot of free tutorials. Maybe the fast-paced ones, or maybe they just doing stuff, uh, you know, for people to see how they make. But the mm -hmm. problem is that they reach a number there that it's not interesting for people to pay to have a class with them anymore because there's so much free stuff that they right. can watch. Yep. So I think you have to be careful yep. there a little bit. Well, here's how, here's the distinction. I'll give you the, 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 the million dollar idea here, the distinction between that. If you were doing a product demo, if you were, you've got a product and you want to show people how to use that product and how it works and how easy it is to use it, that is the content that you would give away for free. Mm -hmm. Right. If you are if you are trying to teach and you have a course, you don't give that away for free. You just do a teaser for that one, a, a trailer, if you will, just like a regular you know movie would have a uh, two to three minute little trailer in this video. Here's what I'm going to teach you. This is a class on this. Here's how I'm going to teach you. This is what you're going to learn. And by the time it's done, this is what you'll create. And then you say this is how much the course is and you invite them to take the course. If you give that kind of content away for free, you're right. They're never going to buy from you. So. Product demos are always free. Let me show you how a product works because I want you to buy the product. If I'm going to teach you a tutorial and teach you a skill, then you, you, know, you need to collect some money for that. Yeah. And like Franklin Covey used to say, start with the end in mind. When you start approaching any social network, you have to understand and have it very clear what you want from that. Is it right. just visibility? Do you want to be famous? or do you want to sell something out of that, be the art itself, the class? Because it's different. Uh, we also get that all the time, Rob. Oh, but I have 10,000 followers, subscribers, whatever it is, on YouTube, Facebook, whatever. Well, that's fine and dandy, but are they buyers? Because if they are not, and I'm trying to sell something, for me yeah. it's not useful. And people, you know, people it, love to shop, they love to buy, right? But they mm -hmm. hate to be sold. So yes. I think you know, the, the more passive approach is, here, look at this beautiful art. You know, picture this in your living room. Picture this in your game room. Picture this in your, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, you'll find people will have always that corner of their house or their living room or something where they need a little something. There's something that's going to fit in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I guess we call it a tchotchke in, in, in the <laughs> slang, right? Uh, and they'll be looking for, for that kind of thing, and they'll come across it. And we're having a lot of success with, uh, you know, people I'm working with right now selling on Instagram just with that, mm -hmm. is being able to say, you know, they're buying ads, they're paying for the, the placement and it's just the photo and it's something really cool or it's a very short video less than 30 seconds 15 second videos sometimes and you know hey that looks cool they'll click through and they'll, they'll end up purchasing it so yeah there's you know that's the whole thing it's like you really have to uh, you know again it goes back to the photo it goes back to the video it's got to be good quality again if you're not the one to do that if you don't want to learn those skills you know, there's somebody with a smartphone somewhere that knows how to take good photos that you <laughs> yes. know. You know what I mean? And it's not hard to ask them to come over and, hey, come over for some tea. And, and by the way, bring your phone, smartphone. I, want, I need a few photos of something. You know? People love it. It's, it's fun. I mean, I, I fell in love with photography uh, way back when, when I was 12. <laughs> I fell in love with True. photography. It's never, it's never ended, right? <laughs> and, and people are so scared of cameras, but... You know, like you said, you can show the product only. You don't need to be talking. You don't need to show your face. So there are ways around that you can st still have a very good video, but you don't have it to be in front of the camera if it's a bad hair day or things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of tutorial videos that are just showing the people's hands and doing the work. I, I am not ter terribly a fan of those um, because the eyeball to eyeball connection, like I'm looking at you, you're looking mm -hmm. at your screen right now and it looks like I'm looking right at you. Boy, I wish I could see you. Um, you know <laughs> what I mean? But it, it's that connection that makes everything. We're human beings. We're biologically, you know, uh, programmed to connect with other people, with other human beings. So. Um, 
um, just be who you are. You're an artist. You're wild. You're you're fun. You're you're whatever you are. Just be that. Mm -hmm. And the people who love you will love you forever. And those who don't love you, they're not your market. Let them go. Let them go find someone else. It's not yeah, the end of the world. You're not going to be loved by everybody. Period. Right. And, and it's, the truth is, you know, I know every time I do a video, there are people are going, ugh, ugh. You know, I hate that guy. Get him off my screen. <laughs> and there are people who go, man, this guy has such good value. I can't wait to hear more. You know. Mm -hmm. And it's like I just worry about those people who want to hear more. The rest, yeah. eh, you know, I'm not their guy. It's fine. You know? <laughs> Beverly's asking, for artists, would you recommend Pinterest? I think we talked a little bit about that. I come on just when he finished talking about that. Oh, so yes or no for that question? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Bree, I don't Double yes. Think, say it again. Double yes. Double yes. So double <laughs> yes, Beverly. Bree is asking, I don't think anything beats the live classes. Curious Mondo host. Thank you. I got to ask as I learn, not the same as just watching. Yeah, Correct. we are absolutely. trying a different model. Yeah, absolutely. When you do live classes like that and, and you know, this is the difference between live casting and television, right? Television is no feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Television is just, we're blasting the information out at you and you, have, you, know, you can't say anything. If you want to complain, maybe you have to write a letter. You know what I mean? But with live webcasting and, and the internet, it's like, yeah, you do have that interaction. And, you know, you as the viewer can actually be part of and direct in some way uh, mm -hmm. the content. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even today we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, what are we going to talk about today? We didn't really have a hard and fast plan. But, you know what? The people viewing are asking the questions and they're literally directing and building and producing this particular webcast, which is very, uh, very unique to this uh, format, which you can't do anywhere else. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. I love it. I actually think it's the best format. Ever. Absolutely. Well, I think it gives <laughs> we live in a in a society that we are connected so much, but we are one more, you know, like you are one of my five thousand friends. I don't really know who you are, what you do, what you like. And we feel like we don't matter. So I think what this type of format brings back is that, yes, you matter. What you ask matter. Actually, what you ask makes the whole show, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's more interesting for the viewer when they're getting their questions answered rather than we have a plan and we're just going to deliver this content and it may or may not answer your question and you got to sit here for an hour, it's better to be able to type in the chat room and say, hey, you're the guys with the knowledge. Here's what I need to know. Tell me. And they get that information. They're going to stay with it. And, and it's more valuable. It's more interesting for them. Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, Sandy is asking, how about Twitter? Is it a thing of the past or what? Yeah, we've been doing a, a lot of testing with Twitter and uh, it's a no-go as far as art goes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't fit. We have 19,000 people on our Twitter account, and a lot of them are artists. It doesn't bring much either. <laughs> I have 19,000 on my Twitter account, too. And, yeah. uh, you know, you put a post up, you put a tweet, and you look at the response, and 100 people have seen it, and two people have clicked. Yeah. Yeah. It's taken me years to build it up, but, but it's like it's just not, no, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a platform to use for that. Uh, it's really good for yelling in politics and screaming at people and getting angry, but exactly. it's just not, not, it's not <laughs> where the, you want to be. Very and toxic. the news, whenever something is happening, that you, that's the easiest play to, place to go. And well, yeah, it's kind of, you look at it and you think, of, you think of Twitter as the pulse of the internet. It's not a place to market. It's not a place to brand. It's not a place to sell. Um, it's just people, you know, bitching and moaning and complaining. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, it's not, it's not a place you want to spend time. Uh, I have also, Sandy saying, I have also learned that a story sells, a fact only tells. Well, good. Do you want to talk about that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think this is a piece that a lot of artists miss. And I always, when I'm at a festival or something and I, and I see art that I really like and want to purchase, I'll always ask, what's the story behind it? What's the motivation? Why did you create this? Are you excited about this kind of art? You know, it's like there's always a story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, we had one artist that uh, would go and do uh, research into history. And a lot of the history was represented in the art that they were creating, the Southwest history. And it was like, it was really fascinating to me to sit there and hear the story. And I'm like, if you want to sell this, all you need to do is have the story in there of how this came about, what it means, what the relevance is, you know, what it's reflective of. And, and yeah, people absolutely buy it. So the more story you have, absolutely, the more you sell. Rather than just saying, hey, here's some jewelry I made. 
Mm -hmm. You might go in and say, I chose these beads because of their, you know, blah, 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 blah. They, there's the properties of the stones. This is, you know, they're rare stones. They come from this part of the country. It's the only place you can find them. You know, there's a story behind every piece of art. Yes. And, you know, yes. it's better to share that. And I know some people are like, oh, I just like doing the art. Okay, great. You know, you may sell it, you may not. But the more you can tell about it, absolutely, the more you're going to sell. Uh, in marketing, the more you tell, the more you sell is, is kind of our mantra. And, you know, that's why there's long sales letters, and long videos to sell things. Mm -hmm. and, and it works. It just, it's always worked. Yep. Uh I think this answers part of this next question from guest 104. How can I distinguish myself as an artist and not a crafter? I feel like crafter perception takes away the value of my art. I think for, for part of it is how you're positioning your art and how you're telling the story of what you're creating. Yeah, and, and what prices you're charging too. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're charging crafter prices, they're going to see you as a crafter. If you're charging fine art, fine art prices, that's a different story. We see them in the gourd world. We see people charging $25 for a gourd art piece, and we see people charging $250, $2,500, $5,000. It's like they separate themselves based on how they're, they're positioning themselves. And a lot of times they'll do that with their pricing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you're, you're selling at crafter prices, that's all you're going to be seen as. I think we all fall into tr into that trap. Now, as an artist myself, I also started going to craft shows and any type of fairs because I thought that's how I get the visibility. And right. it was good up to a point until the moment that my skills got better, my pieces got better, and they would never sell in those type of environments. Then I, I actually, it was like, oh, now I need to transition to a different kind of environment to keep on going, right? So the right. craft show didn't do anymore because the people that go to a craft show, they are willing to spend five, 20, 30 bucks on whatever they buy. They're not going to spend 2,500 on anything. Exactly. So, so we need to come to that realization. It's the same thing, Shahar, if you look at uh, buying an app for your smartphone, right? How much are people happy paying for an app? 99 cents, $1.99, $2.99, $3.99, right? And when an app is sold for $20, you go, wow, wow, yeah. they're asking a lot of money for that, right? Yeah. So get out of the app store, go on the website, go on the web and, and buy regular software. Mm -hmm. Like go buy Photoshop or go buy something like that, $695 for it. We're okay with that. We'll mm -hmm. pay that but not if it's an app. Right? So it's, it's really is you got to get yourself out of that, uh, that mindset of, of, you know, the pricing is always the issue because if you're in a, in a craft uh, arena and there are other crafters around, everyone's selling at the, basically the same price point that that range of prices and you're out of that range, you're not going to sell anything because that's not what the customers are there to buy. Mm -hmm. You know, you look out of place, but if you're in a place where everyone's selling stuff at 2,500 and above and you put your stuff at 2,500, you fit right in. So, so it's, that, it's that's where the research comes from. Uh, yes. In your place or online, where can you sell that would match what you think your art is worth right, right now? Yep. Right? Yep, absolutely. You got you to find those markets. You got to find those marketplaces. They're out there. Mm -hmm. They're out there. And they may not be fellow crafters. They may be business professionals. They may be, you know, fashion people. They may be out, outside in a different industry altogether. Yeah. You, know, you always want to look for markets that have money. That's number one. Yeah. <laughs> got to be and, able to look yes. for and many of us, we have this uh, thing with money, right? That we avoid thinking about it. We avoid talking about it. But if you want to sell your art, that needs to be part of the process. What kind of buyer sh should I attract? Where are they? Right. Right. Uh, Addison is asking, how about Facebook Live? I love Facebook Live. We're doing it now. Right now? <laughs> right here, right now. Um, it would be hard to say I don't like it. I love it. <laughs> I do it every week, too. And, and it's real important to do that for, uh, you know, depending on what it is you're selling. It's like Facebook Live is really cool. Uh, like I said, if you're going to give a tutorial and you're going to give the tutorial away, you're not going to be able to sell it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do a product demo, then Facebook Live is perfect for that. Yeah. You know, same, same rules apply there. Mm -hmm. And... Do you know if Facebook is still pushing more live or not? Because I know yes. Instagram was pushing yes. really hard live and it's something so new there, but they are not anymore. Yeah, they just released IGTV. This was on Wednesday of this week. Okay. Um, now you can put live streaming video up to an hour in length before it was one minute in length. So now you can do an hour long video. The difference is you can't shoot the video this way. 
It's no, got to be me, cell phone you, format, so it's got to be this way. Okay. It's got to be portrait mode, right? And um, when you do that, then, uh, you know, they, they'll accept that video. That's the video you can do. So, you know, for us doing it, we're doing it sort of, you know, landscape and rather than portrait. This doesn't fit the Instagram model at all. Mm -hmm. you know? I was thinking, I, I don't know about Instagram, Robert. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that crazy about it. <laughs> So, you know, that's a big thing, Shahar, you brought that up because that's, that's a big thing with people. It's like I always um, encourage them to spend time on the networks that they enjoy. Mm -hmm. You don't enjoy Twitter. There's nothing you're going to do that's ever going to make Twitter work. Nothing. Right. It's just not going to happen. I don't enjoy Twitter. I have it, but, you know, I don't really enjoy playing with it. Um, and Facebook better. Yeah, Instagram, okay, I'm starting to warm up to it like you. It's like I'm not really crazy about it. Everything's done on the phone, and the screen's so small, and you, there's no really web interface that you can do anything with. So I just feel like I don't have a lot of control there. So I, you know, I don't like it as much, um, but I know it works, so I do it because I have to. So start with the, the network that you love. If you're a Pinterest lover, you're in love with Pinterest, then go there. Work on that. Build that up. Um, you know, it's always, it's going to be more fun for you if you're doing something you enjoy than something you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one last topic for us to discuss, Robert, the importance of communications. So we talk about social media and it looks like, okay, I can communicate with people all day long here, right? Uh, doing videos, just posting stuff. But again, like you mentioned before, I don't have control over this communication. So my question to you is, should we still be building email lists, sending emails, like everything else you hear, oh, it still works, it doesn't work at all. <laughs> so how should I go, to lay a plan for me as an artist? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. It's one that uh, I'm answering a lot for my customers right now. And and does email still work? Yeah, it does. Is it as good as it used to be? No. Uh, this GDPR thing that came up May 25th, it became law. Um, it crushed a lot of people's email lists. Uh, some as you know lost 80% of their subscribers. Uh, and that's not a, a an oddball story. It's happened quite a bit. So does email still work? Yes. So still build an email list? Yes, absolutely. Still use social media? It? Yes, absolutely. Still do Pinterest, still do Instagram, still do a little bit of paid advertising. And depending on your business, I would even encourage you to do some direct mail. Um, and what you'll see is that your success is going to be the sum total of all of those things. A lot of people say, I just want to do one thing. We're not in that world anymore. You can't just do one thing. Uh, I was just at a seminar with uh, Bill Glazer, and we uh, had 49 different business professionals and marketers come up and talk. Not one of them we're using fewer than three different media to do their promotions. Some use as many as 11 different media to promote. So the real trick here today in today's market is you got to use it all. And you can't just say, well, I'm just going to cherry pick. I'm going to do this, but not that. Um, you've got to use as many of them as you can. Yeah. I, I was trying to count as you were talking, and I, I would say we, we are probably about eight or nine different yes. ones every day. Yep. But the fact is that... Because we have a list, because we know, know people's email, let's suppose a crisis happened tomorrow of any type, okay? And I need to get some money. I can go communicate with that list, make a promotion, and get the money. Yes. On Facebook, even though, you know, I have pages there that also have 19,000 people, I can post the same promotion there, and I'm lucky if 100 of them see. Right. Right. So I, I, I just need need people to understand that as everything that you control, you can trigger any t any point in time. But it is true. One thing only doesn't work anymore. Doesn't. And, and it's it's hard for an artist to hear that uh, because they really want to spend the time on the art. And that's mm -hmm. why I would always suggest is like you don't want to do this marketing thing. Find somebody who will do it for you. You know, find a store, find a find a gallery, find somewhere that you can put your art and they can do the selling. They can do all of that, all that management of that. Because if you don't enjoy it, then you're not going to do it. I mean, that's the end of it. It's like you can, willpower is only going to take you so far. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got to do Instagram today. I've got to do Instagram today. And you don't look forward to it. Oh, I'll do it after lunch. No, you know what? Oh, I'm too tired now. Forget it. Maybe I'll try after dinner. No, it didn't happen. It's going to go weeks, months, and you're not going to get it done. It's not going to work for you. Yeah. So find somebody who absolutely loves it and is posting 50 times a day and say, hey, would you help me by posting a little bit on my Instagram too, you know? That's the better way to do it. You know, we, we find a lot of instructors here on social media. 
the ones that are yeah. not there, how do I find them today? Uh, we have subscriptions to most magazines out there, but it's becoming more, more and more difficult to find. Yeah, if you're not on social, you pretty, yeah, if you're not on social, you don't exist. I mean, that's just yeah. the way it is. And it's not that you have to have a love affair with Facebook or Instagram. Uh, you have to have a love affair with your the people who want to appreciate your art, and that's where they are. So you've got to go where they are, not because you want to be there, but because <laughs> you want to get the art in front of them, and that's where they happen to be, and that's where you've got to be too. I yeah. love this. I think everybody should write that down. You have to yeah. have a love affair with the people that like your art. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. that's fantastic. Yep. Guess 104. What's the best way to do a live stream about my art? Do I just show what I have? Do I sell it online? Do I share my inspiration? What do you recommend? I would recommend sharing your inspiration, telling your story, telling the story about the piece, how you created it, how long it took you to create it, uh, what inspired you to create it, uh, you know, show other pieces that, you know, just don't have it about one piece. Sometimes that'll get a little boring. Uh, you know, a person or viewer is either going to love it or hate it. And, you know, that's the way we are. So show a couple of pieces, maybe do two or three pieces in, in, a, in a live stream. And you'll find that, you know, people will hear your story and they get to know you, the person. Remember, we buy from people. We don't buy from, from companies, right? It's a misnomer to think, oh, we buy from this company. We really don't. We buy from people. We buy uh, from the person who's created it. We buy from the story. Uh, you know, Apple was all about Steve Jobs forever, right? Wendy's was all about the, 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 the Wendy's guy, right? It was all about him. So the reason that those things exist is because we know people buy from people. So the more they know you, the more they get to like you, the more they appreciate your art, obviously the more they're going to buy from you uh, over time. Great. Yeah. Robert, would you say, I totally forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I totally forgot. What can I say? Okay, what's your final piece of advice to artists trying to market out there? Uh, disconnect your self-esteem from your price that you charge. Mm. That's the biggest problem I see is artists undervalue what they're selling because, well, it's not worth that much, right? Uh, when I first started in photography, photography came easy for me. So I was doing, you know, professional level photography and I was charging amateur prices because I didn't think it was worth that because it was so easy for me, right? Mm -hmm. It was just something that was just something I can do and I just kept doing it and it was fun. It was fun. Um, so you got to disconnect your self-esteem, your self-worth, from how much you're going to charge. And you really got to look out there at the market and see what they're willing to pay. And when I figured that out, I was able to take my prices uh, from, you know, $50 a photo to $500 a photo to $1,000 a photo, right? Because that's what the market would bear. The market would pay that at the time. And it was like, wow, what a big difference. It's like, wow, somebody I spent getting $50 for, I could actually get $1,000 for. And it wasn't about changing anything about what I was doing. It was about changing my mindset of what I believed I was worth. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think they should have written that down as well. Because <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Yeah, it's, it's know, a big one for artists. Yes. Yes. We, well, we the get art is an much. extension of who you are, right? So when mm -hmm. you're creating a piece of art, you're putting your, your heart and soul into it. So it's a reflection of you. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to make that separation to say, well, I'm not this art piece. I am this art piece, right? And how you feel about you is how you feel about that art piece. The value, how you value yourself is how you're going to value that piece. You need to make that separation, though. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say before about the live streaming is that we don't need to be live streaming. And I think it goes together a little bit with this. We don't have to be live streaming only about our art. We can live stream about things that we like, we appreciate, because the more people understand what are your values, your beliefs, why you create, uh, they will tend to engage more with your art as well. Do you oh, agree absolutely. with this? Absolutely. And, and, you know, if you have other people's art that you find, you come across on social media, you want to share a live stream about that. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're having that conversation and your viewers are interested in art, it doesn't have to be just yours. It could be anybody's. Yeah. Oh, I was in the museum today. I saw this photo. Man, it just inspired me. Here's what I think I want to do with what I learned. You know, why not? Yeah. True. True. Share. <laughs> Robert, thank you so much for being here. This was if fun. People want to know more about you i know you have a weekly podcast tell us a little bit about that and how do they get in touch with you i have a weekly podcast you can find on 
any place that podcasts are available from iTunes, iHeartRadio now, and uh, uh, you know Google Play if you're on Android. Uh, the podcast is called Coach's Corner. It is specifically for entrepreneurs, business owners, small business owners, just like all of you. And uh, every week it's uh, tips, hints, strategies, things I come across that I think would be of value. Um, a very fun thing that I enjoy doing. I try to get them done every Saturday. And uh, I will be having more guests on in future podcasts as well. I know people have been asking cool. about that. So we're going to be bringing some more people, and that'll make the podcast a little bit longer and a little bit more fun. So it's all over the, like I said, any podcast. Coach's Corner is the name of the podcast. You can look it up by that, or come to robertimbriali.com, and you'll find it right there uh, on that website. And the buttons to subscribe and all the different services are there as well. You would think this is the end, but I actually have a comment and a question for you. Is that okay? Absolutely. Laurie Platt is saying, this is, that is very true. Artists need to be more confident on the prices they charge. I am guilty of this too many times over. It is daily struggle. I have learned that if you have confidence in yourself and prices the collectors, and uh, if you have confidence in yourself and the prices, the collectors will too. And Sandy is asking, how do you deal with local market prices versus market prices nationally or internationally? How do you deal with them in terms of how you price yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you play in the market where you, you feel comfortable playing, right? If the local market's not going to support your pricing because you live in a little farm town and there's only 300 people there, well, that's not where you sell. Right? You don't want to sell there. Mm -hmm. um, where you live does not necessarily mean that's where you need to sell. We have a global uh, opportunity with the Internet today. We can sell anywhere, right? And, and there's no... There's no border uh, at this point. There may be in the future, but there's no border to where you can and cannot sell. So I would always encourage people to go where the money is, go where the buyers are, and really don't look at it market by market. Look at it segment by segment and say, okay, all my buyers, they're over here. They're on this social network. These are the keywords or the hashtags they're looking up typically. And, uh, you know, position yourself there. You post something on Instagram, for instance, you have no control over where that's going. That's going worldwide. You put hashtags on it, it's going worldwide. You don't know how many thousands of people will see it, right? So when you look at it and say, well, should I worry about the local market? Absolutely not. If you're going into a gallery, you're kind of stuck because your only uh, market is the people who walk through that door, right? So it's a little bit of a different game. But if you're doing the online game, not an issue. Mm -hmm. Brittany is saying, I will be looking for Coach's Corner podcast. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Robert, thank oh, you nice. so much for being here again. It, it was really great. And I hope you come back soon. I hope so. This is fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it is. It's been twice now, right? <laughs> yes, twice. <laughs> Guys, well, let's, I, let the, let's let the audience decide. If they want to see me back, they can post in the chat, bring him back. Right? Great. That's a great idea. So do that. <laughs> And guys, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, of course, this podcast stays whatever you're watching, so you can rewatch as many times as you want. But even better, share with your friends if they can benefit from that. Sandy, Saint Shahar, and Robert, thank you both. Thank you guys for being thank here you. every yeah. single week and participating. Next week, we are going to skip because it's a, a big holiday. People will be traveling, but we'll be back here in the week after. So. See you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.